Why do carbon methodologies keep going so wrong? Like, how does this keep happening? It's been decades now. Even new methodologies produced just in 2024 still seem to like have these underlying issues that cause overissuance. So why is this still taking place? Sinister cabals are scheming to print too many credits. No. Well, maybe a little bit, but mostly no. Uh, most people in this industry, in my experience, are in it for the right reasons. They really do care about the environment and, and what we're doing here. So how does this still happen? Well, there's a simple statistical reason why overissuance keeps occurring in carbon methodologies. Uh, to understand why that is, we have to understand the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is a really basic concept that just says if you have a whole bunch of estimates, uh, then you know none of those individual estimates are going to be particularly right. But on average, if the middle number, the average number, is going to be correct. And the more estimates you have, the closer you get to the correct answer. Okay, let's think about this in terms of a carbon methodology. We have a whole bunch of carbon projects that are estimating how many credits they should be getting. Uh, some of them are going to be overestimating how many credits they should be getting, and some of them are going to be underestimating how many credits they should be getting. No problem here, right? According to the central limit theorem, our methodology is going to issue the appropriate amount of carbon credits, even though any particular project is maybe good or bad. Now, there are good methodologies and bad methodologies out there, but as long as we adhere to the central limit theorem, we should be pretty safe. For example, uh, let, let's just zoom into one facet of carbon you know, methodologies here, which is just measuring how much carbon there is in the forest. Uh, we have methodologies that are really, really precise in how you have to measure your carbon. You have to go and you have to wrap tape measures around trees and you got to prove that you really worked hard to do it. Uh, I would include things like the California Air Resource Board or Open Forest Protocol where they require you to wrap tape measures around trees in fixed area plots and then take pictures with cameras. In those methodologies, uh, you're you're still going to have air. You're never going to be perfect unless you've like mapped and measured every tree with like 3D whatever. Okay. But you know, you're, you're going to be more clustered around the, the center around where you should be. So you're, you're, you're still going to have projects that overestimate and underestimate, but like for the most part, all the projects are going to be pretty close to the actual number. Then you have your kind of lower effort methodologies. Those out there that, for example, say you can just use a regional average. Well, okay, in that case, you're not going to be as clustered around the center, but if you just use the regional average for a particular strata of forest, well, the central limit theorem still works out. You're still going to be around the center here, right? So some are going to be above the regional average and some are going to be below the regional average, and your carbon methodology still produces the correct amount of carbon credits. Well, there's a couple of small hitches to that that right there. If you're a buyer, you don't you probably want the higher quality methodology because you don't want to buy from a carbon project that is over issuing credits, e even if there's another one to balance it out. So, you know, we still have this situation where like buyers probably don't want the, the, the bad credits on the on, on these kind of low effort methodologies um, that there is another problem that could arise due to the low effort methodology, which is that if you do just use a regional average, you might be creating an economic incentive to only enroll projects that are kind of overestimating their carbon stock because it might not be financially viable if, you know, your regional average is really low, despite the fact that your carbon, your, your project has a lot of carbon. So, so through that, uh, a lousy methodology does introduce a small bias that could result in some overissuance. But something even worse happens here if you give people the option to choose a regional average or uh, measure your carbon by hand. And, and what happens there is that people are going to start with the cheaper choice. And they're, so they're going to start with the, the um, they're going to start by taking the regional average and, and they're going to have a widespread of carbon outcomes. But the carbon projects that are underestimating their carbon now have a strong financial incentive to go out and manually measure their trees. And so they're going to do that. <laughs> Whereas the ones that are happy with the carbon estimate or are, you know, maybe issued a little too many credits, they're going to be fine with it. They're, they're not going to go and invest money to prove that they have, like, have less carbon than they say. So what's happened here is that 
Now, Carbon Project developers who are not getting enough credits through the regional approach are going to spend extra money to, you know, get their number up. And just like that, they're going to get the correct estimate, and we still have these projects that are overcredited. The central limit theorem has been destroyed. This is a very niche topic here, right? We're talking about, like, carbon measurements. And obviously, what, what got me started on this was the American Carbon Registries. Uh, they have a protocol that lets you pick, you know, one or the other. But here's the important point. Every single time that there's a decision in a carbon methodology, you are destroying the central limit theorem. So every single time that a carbon methodology lets a project developer pick, you know, from like three different ways of doing things, you are ensuring that they're going to start with the cheapest way, and then they're going to, you know, anyone who feels undercredited there is then going to pick the method that gives them more credits. And so this applies to absolutely everything in carbon methodologies, from leakage calculations to baseline measurements to actually measuring the carbon in the trees, and, and, and other project types as well. And that is why every time that you see a carbon methodology that, that presents carbon project developers with a series of choices, it's pretty close to guaranteed that that methodology is going to be over issuing carbon credits. But it's worth pointing out that we got into this situation through no malintent. You see, the, the methodology developers and the registries, they thought to themselves, well, you know, not everyone can afford to tromp around and, and, and measure their trees by hand. We should give people who want to really prove that they have more carbon the, the option of doing that. Right? That's a good thing, right? No, it's not. But they thought it was. Um, and then project developers, I mean, what's wrong with that? I mean, project developers, likewise, only have pure intentions. You know, those who are actually trying to prove how much carbon they have, like, why not take the more expensive approach to prove that that's the case and get the proper amount of credits? They only care about their project. They don't care about the methodology at large. And, and those that are happy with the, the you know, regional average or, or whatever it happens to be, like, you know, they, they seem satisfied. They're going to get enough credits, maybe a little bit more, but, you know, that's fault of the methodology. So without any sinister intention, that's how so many of these carbon methodologies end up producing too many carbon credits. Um, and I think it just results from, um, once again, I think methodology writers are not really cognizant of these statistical principles that they have to be very careful of. It's much better to have a methodology that issues that does a bad job at measuring carbon than it is to have a methodology that offers you the choice of a bad job and a good job, uh, because it just ruins the statistics otherwise. As much as any other component of like carbon methodologies, the key to a good methodology is lack of choice, not getting giving people the slightest option. And what that really goes back to is, is repeatability. You should always end up getting the same carbon number from a methodology, no matter who's developing the, the project. So that's one way of kind of weeding out good methodologies from bad. And on that principle, we have a long way to go.